Makarov to Stokes, who's onside. Watch out! Here's Sims. It's a good serve this from Southampton. They could finish the job here. It's Shane Long. Hello and welcome to the Saints FC podcast. Um, Tom, I was just thinking, I was listening back to that commentary there in that that intro, and I think this season might be the season that we get to add another bit of famous commentary to to the Saints FC podcast intro. I mean, I don't think there's been anything quite worthy just yet since Shane Long's um, goal in the semi-final, but I think we might have a moment coming this season. What, What do you think, Tom? And then anything to add to that rich tapestry would be would be really something, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is episode ninety-seven. We're edging dangerously close to episode one hundred. D- don't know what we're going to do, Tom. I mean, it's not like we can have a party or anything for this. I have to have a brainstorm at least. Yeah. Hopefully, Saints can go top again for that. I mean, if they time that for the hundredth episode, that would have been great. But no complaints. They can go top again. Go top and stay top for that. Um, so hello and welcome everyone. We are still sponsored by Manscaped, the the gentleman's um, below the waist uh, shaving equipment stuff. So um, Tom and I were sent some of that, and we we kind of we we probably chatted about our new sponsors product almost like teenage um, teenagers would, you know, giggling our way through it, like we're kind of naughty schoolboys. Um, and, you know, we, we were pleased that we brought you some comedy value as well as the exceptional financial um, value as well. So you get 20% off and free postage if you go to manscaped.com and enter in the code SAINTS, all in block capitals, SAINTS. You should know how to spend that. Spell that. Uh, but also, not only do they give us great comedy value, not only do they give us um, some wonderful freebies, including a ball spritz. I mean, who knew that that product existed? Um, not only do they give the comedy, the, the financial benefit, but they are also giving um, benefit to the testis- Testicular Cancer Society as well. So... Um, Their mission is to make a more open and confident male culture that results in guys being way more proactive around self-care and health and partnered with this society, a non-profit organisation to raise awareness about the most common form of cancer in men between the ages of 15 and 35. Um, And so to to help support the fighters, survivors and caregivers uh, for that. So, you know, not only comedy, not only a great deal with the 20% off and the free postage using the Saints Code, but also... um, Great bit of charity work there as well. So, you know, it's it's a sponsor that's got it all, Tom, isn't it? It's a 360 win. Yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely. I, I'm oh, sure all our day. listeners are going to be really disappointed that we haven't, like, giggled our way through some stupid... <laughs> like on the back of a school bus. Or yeah. <laughs> anyway, there we go. So we're doing the serious, serious advert there. But, yeah, do make sure you... Um, uh, make use of that offer if you want to, Tom. I don't know if you spotted, but there's I snuck an extra episode of the Saints FC podcast in in between last week when we spoke and yes, this week. I did, you little, you know, little devious man, you. Yeah. So um, we had the ultimate Saints Eleven episode, um, which uh, uh, Ben Miller, friend of the podcast, uh, arranged for us, and um, he spoke to Ed Chamberlain, his Sky Sports News presenter, and he chose his favourite ever Saints Eleven. And um, really, really good uh, episode. And, and um, we've had some really lovely feedback. I know about half our usual listeners have um, listened to that already. So if you haven't and you're listening to this episode, just stay on at the end and, and carry on listening. It should be there in your, your downloaded episodes. Um, and let us know what you think. Saints FC Podcast at gmail.com. Loads of great um, feedback on Twitter. And we will be doing another episode with Ben relatively shortly. So watch that space. So that's that's really cool. Are you going to do your mystery player yet, or are you going to make us wait forever for your cult hero? Well, I was I was thinking about one player who um, then, in a kind of social media conversation, became maligned as probably being the first name on the team sheet of the worst ever Saints eleven. So, 
I've had to have a little bit of a rethink, Tom, because clearly if I mention this name, I'm going to be absolutely laughed at the podcast and everyone will turn Don't away. Let peer pressure do this to you, John. Yeah. This is your man. This is your man. Who was it? Tell us. Well, I really liked Fabrice Fernandez. He was great. There's nothing wrong with that. Also, pops up a lot in the last couple of weeks about direct free kicks. Yeah. No, I, I quite liked him, but everyone else apparently finds him really frustrating. And they're like, oh, he'd always just, you know, cut in and then put it on his stronger foot. And it's always so obvious. But I remember the opposition teams not really being alive to that. They're always trying to show him down the wing or kind of expecting him to go down the wing and put the cross in that way. And he'd always cut in. I remember him linking up with James Beattie really well and loads of goals coming yeah. from that. He's a probably just a bit ahead of his time, wasn't he, for that sort of Saints era? Yeah. I, I remember him being a very cultured, quite small player, which again was different for the time. He was a, he was a good footballer. There's nothing wrong with Fabrice Fernandez. And a bit of alliteration, what's not to like? Yeah. So there we go. I, I don't know. Maybe the inverted winger is too much for some of our listeners. Um, obviously, listeners, yeah. if you do want to send in a complaint to me about. Uh, my suggestion of Fabrice Fernandez. You know the email address, saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. Tom, this episode is really, really exciting because we're going to be talking about something that hasn't happened since 1988. Certainly mm-hmm. hasn't happened since we've been recording the podcast. I don't know when the first podcast was recorded, but certainly you know, not in that relatively that. recent. Um, and I think, you know, we'll go through the game Saints versus Newcastle, but I think there's so many talking points and what I've We'll, we'll try and go through it relatively quickly, although there's a lot to talk about, because I think we need to talk about some of the the wider things. I think we need to look at the macro version of Saints of how we ended up at the top of the league, even if it was only after eight games for you know, a day and a half, because it, it's a very different position to where we were a year ago. And I, th- I think it needs some wider reflection. I think that's a very good idea, John. Okay. Right. So, we start off Friday night football. Um, No (laughs) doubt the Sky Sports um, presenters all reminded us what happened last time Saints had a game at St Mary's on a Friday night. We're not going to cover that. Um, One of the things that I was quite interested in is that I remember a few years ago when Pochettino was our manager, we did have a chance to go top of the league briefly. Um. And that was if we could dispatch Arsenal at the Emirates. I think we lost that match 2-0. And do you yeah. remember what happened, Tom? That was when uh, Arthur's having a party at his house. Barak uh, tried to cry of turn one of the Arsenal forwards. I don't know which one. It went horribly wrong fairly early in the game, didn't it? From memory, and that was it. It just all went a bit downhill from there. Yeah, it was, it was pretty dreadful. I mean, to make <coughs> matters worse, Tom... Um, as as you know, I used to live in in Hackney in East London, and uh, I'd found out a pub that was showing the game, and it was one of those ones where the 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 pub had some sort of satellite dish that could pick up um, foreign channels. So I think it was yeah. like it might have been a Saturday three o'clock game, but they were still showing it. They had um, some sort of way, some sort of method. Of some sort being of murky, murky way of doing it. <laughs> and uh, obviously being in kind of like North London, um, there was just loads and loads of Arsenal fans in the pub. And there was me and one other Saints fan uh, watching this game. And we just kind of had to sit there and watch Arta Boric do this and just everyone else going wild. It was... it was. The, the, one of the worst things about times, things like that is because if you're in pubs like that often, you get with... Um, like a weird for the big clubs, you know, Man United's, Arsenal's, Liverpool's, you get this weird like foreign fan mm. who is not from the UK who they kind of lack historical perspective on things that the sort of English football fan has. And I've had this for Saints and they, they can be quite difficult to manage. <laughs> can you explain, Tom? Well, like, they, they sort of like, they, they could be from like the other side of the planet, but they'll be like a diehard Liverpool fan. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they're like they'll die for Liverpool, and then they, they, you know, they, they talk about things and they, they can wind you up because normally as well, because by that point you're on the wrong end of it. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, exactly like you were in that pub in Hackney. Yeah. Um, do you remember when we recorded that episode with the Chelsea game in that pub, and there were some quite drunk people in there, and they just kept on interrupting us, didn't they? I think we had about five takes at one point. Yeah, what Chelsea game was that? I can't remember what was the score. Uh, uh, it was dreadful, Tom. I don't think we need to remember. What the score was. 
oh gosh, we got hammered, didn't mm, we? Mm, yeah, and we got hammered. Um, anyway, so let's let's take our, ourselves quickly on to St Mary's. Uh, Saints to Newcastle nil. Starting things up, I mean, the lineup was quite like Ralph had us guessing, didn't he? Until an hour yeah. before the game, and even actually once the lineup was released, it was quite interesting to see it. Obviously, we had no Danny Ings um, and no Ryan Bertrand. To um, you know, our listeners don't need to know that those two are absolute. You know, key players. Danny Ings really obviously so, but Ryan Bertrand has been a, a mainstay of Saints left back for a, a long period of time. Um, we didn't have Jake Vokins available to, to step into left back, so uh, in came uh, Jack Stevens. Yeah. And um, shout out, by the way, to your brother sharing the wrong team on WhatsApp before, throwing everything into a complete <laughs> tailspin. <laughs> Did he do um, that? I, I missed, yeah, he, I missed he that. Like, he said like some weird team that was a prediction and then I found the real, it was very confusing. But um, yeah, and no one really knew what, so the team came out and you were like looking at it like, is it 5-3-2? Mm. You know, like, Stevens is in there. Um, you didn't really know, did you, what, what sort of yeah, formation he was going to play play from that, did you? Play playing left back? That's mm. what, you know, it was all sorts of things like that, all sorts of questions going on like, um, you know, we played three centre backs to accommodate Gineppo at left back. It was all a bit weird, wasn't it? But turns out that Ralph's just got a system, and he, by hook or by crook, he's sticking to it. Yeah, I, I think as well. I mean, whilst uh, we we might lay into James for sending in the wrong um, team sheet, we should also wish him to get well soon because he has got the COVID bug. No. Yeah, and he is asthmatic, so he's getting through that. But he, also, so follow this. This is a little chat on my family WhatsApp group. So, James, I think I've lost my sense of taste slash smell now. My sister chips in with, oh, no, that's not good. And James goes, it's okay. The last thing I tasted was that sweet victory last night that took Saints <laughs> to the top of the Premier League table, which like I it. thought was a bit of comedy that was wasted in the family group. Uh, uh, so I had to bring it here. So, uh, you know, maintain your sense of humour. Exactly. So re- recovering com- from COVID, but um, yeah, maintaining a sense of humour and obviously buoyed by Saints' um, success. So yeah, we had Jack Stevens in left back and then, um, you know, guessing on that. Uh, and um, then instead of Danny Ings, we had Walcott up front. Um, Redmond kind of kept his place on the bench, which meant Gineppo came in, which I, I think was yeah. maybe a little bit of a surprise. So down that left side, we had Stevens and Gineppo, which... I was a little bit anxious about, but actually they equipped themselves pretty well, I thought. Well, you've got to look as well. I mean, you know, um, we, I I was at the Newcastle game at, the, at St Mary's, and Newcastle kind of have four things going for them. One is John Joe Shelby. He wasn't playing. The other one is Andy Carroll. He was on the bench. And the other two are Almiron and uh, Alistair Maximum. And Alison Maxim is a serious talent, and I, I have to confess, John, when I when I saw that team and I thought, gosh, you know, Stevens, you know, you think Steve Bruce is going to realise what's happening and within minutes just sort of pin Alison Maximum just full time against uh, Gineppo, who, you know, I think last time he played left wing back, one of the I think one of the last ones was Sheffield United away when they ended up scoring mm-hmm. that worldie, but you know, he looked very poor at left wing back and Stevens. Um, for all his industrious hard work, is is definitely not a left back. I mean, he's not even left footed. So, um, I was uh, I was alarmed, let's say. But, I mean, interestingly enough, we needn't have been, because in a weird way, with this weird sort of mashup of a of a lineup, I thought it ended up being one of the best Saints performances un- yeah. under Ralph. I, and I, I, I go as far as I say it's probably the best. Yeah. It was I really good, it. wasn't it? It was, it was enjoyable. And I mean, that's not to say that I don't think Stevens offered anything near as much as Bertrand did on, it normally does in the left back. And, you know, Gineppo didn't offer as much as Redmond does on one of his good days. And Walcott didn't finish like Danny Ings. And yet, despite all of those things that made Saints lesser in those sort of individual positions as a team the level of concentration and performance like the the team unit was just immense so good yeah well what was brilliant i mean if you look at those players individually um 
I was quite worried about Musa Gineppo tracking back his effort, his tackling. Fair play to the guy. Yeah, he put in a hell of a shift, um, both going forward and going back. And with Stevens as well at left back, what was great about it is he didn't try and be Ryan Bertrand. Yeah, he didn't. He he knew his limitations, but he also knew his strengths, which is you know he's a he's a good defender and he's a good reader of the game, and he just he kind of planted himself as a very old fashioned style left back. You know, he didn't try and beat his man, didn't try and go forward, but also didn't leave Saints vulnerable uh, against you know Almirana and Sam Maxman. And you know, to your point, John, and this was a kind of a you know, this isn't a game that when you scroll back through the end of the season and you look at the results, you're ever going to really remember as a, you know, a wonderful game, I think, or a wonderful, you know, remarkable thing. But in many ways, what was the most remarkable thing about it was its unremarkableness because Saints just dispatched Newcastle. Yeah, and, and let, let's talk about how they did that because, I mean, it was enjoyable. I think we need to pick up some of the real talking points of the, the um, game. Firstly, well, I'll start off with Adams' goal. Happened quite early on. All starts with Adams pressing um, Newcastle's right back. Uh, the ball gets turned over. Uh, I think it ends up going via maybe Ward Prowse and Armstrong and then back to Adams. He has that fantastic shot, um, which is it Darlo, the, the Newcastle keeper? Yeah, yeah makes Very makes a good awesome. save. Um, Theo Walker is sort of hanging around in the box at this point. Carl Walker-Peters kind of senses the... Um, danger and goes to to start pressing Almer on. Walcott suddenly sees what's happening, joins in, picks up the ball and puts in, I think, a really, really good cross for Che Adams. Almost looks as though he's overhit it, but actually what it does is it just means the move happens so fast and Che Adams has got the ability to just ping that one in before you know the Newcastle defenders or the keeper have really had a chance to set themselves and be ready for it. Yeah. It, what, what's amazing about this is you're eight minutes into a Premier League game. This is the pinnacle of, you know, European football and Premier League. Um, and, you know, players are coached and coaches have all this intelligence, all this insight, all this analysis. You know, they must do, you know, look at all the games and, and everything. And you can imagine, like, Steve Bruce would have said to his players, like, they're going to press you in, the, you know, in Ralph's red zone. And what you, you know, just get rid of the ball. You know, like, particularly early on in the game, just get rid of that ball. Don't fanny about with it. But, but you know, the first... I think those are probably the exact words Steve Bruce would use as well. Steve, Steve Bruce probably would say that. But, you, but the thing is, what's amazing, you know, much like Aston Villa giving James Ward Prowse two free shots at goal from 20 and 25 yards, is they do it anyway. And Saints press creates both these chances. And... You can imagine, like, you're Steve Bruce, you've got all these best laid plans, and then you just watch Almiron try and just try and beat two Saints players. But you're right, there's still a lot to do. But Walcott, you know, I think he divided the fan base. I think some people thought he was a bit sentimental. But, but God, like, he's really good, isn't he? He's, he like, is he's really good. really good. I mean, I knew that he was really good when he was 16. Everyone could see that. But it's great the fact that he's still really good at 31 years old. Yeah. And he's so up for it as well. He's oh, just thrilled. so up for it. I mean, his, his interview after... I mean, this was one of my... This is one of my talking points towards the end of the, the podcast. Do we want to go through the game or do we just want to no, let's, lavish... Let's go through the game, but you're right. Cause, but, but what's great as well, if you watch the, the goal, is brilliant because you've got Walker Peters and Walcott just giving, you know, they give no quarter, do they, to Almiron? No. And then Shea Adams, the bloke who can knit a cow's arse with a banjo, just, you know, now he's... But also what's great about that, that there's a mini story in itself there, isn't there? There's like Danny Ings, the talisman, the, one of the best goal scorers in the English football, gets injured. Can Shea Adams step up? Seven minutes into the game, Shea Adams is like, yeah, I can do this. We've got this, guys. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, there's a a point isn't there where like if it gets to 60 70 minutes and Saints haven't scored and Chad Adams and Walcott have both missed a couple of chances then maybe the the worry the anxiety you know starts to to kind of set in which we didn't have that and then also the other great thing about doing that is is then Newcastle have to try and play they can't just mm. sit back for the rest of the game try and soak up the pressure and make one chance and try and make it count 
Um, they have to do something. And it was interesting with Newcastle because they were they were almost trying to press, but doing it nowhere near as well as Saints were pressing. And they kept on getting found out because the Saints midfield kept on playing the ball through the Newcastle lines really effectively. Vestergaard was absolutely brilliant at this, I thought. Yeah. You know, drawing out the um, Newcastle front line and midfielders and then finding Ward Prowse or Romeo. And not so much threading it through the eye of a needle, but threading it, you know, they were good passes. They weren't easy passes, if yeah, you know what I mean. They're, like not, he's doing. they're not speculative. I mean, this is one of the things that I think has changed with Saints is there's, there's fewer speculative passes. Mm. I think... Um, if you look at, like, Vestgaard in particular, you know, but it's, it's funny because it's slightly different to what Stevens is doing. So last year, what, Stevens got, what, two or three assists by sort of, you know, walking forward, no one really stopping him and, and lobbing that ball with his right foot, you know, particularly, obviously, the goal that springs to mind is, is Danny Ings against, against Tottenham is a good example of that. But I think he also did the same against Newcastle. Mm. Um, but with, with Vestergaard, Vestergaard gives you something slightly different where he runs forward and he, he sort of fizzes it into the forwards and I think you know we saw this a couple of times with Shea Adams Shea Adams who you know he looks a hell of a player doesn't he like if you're you know if you boil it down like that guy has got strength he's got pace he's got aggression he's got close control and now he's added he seems to be you know he's, he's adding finishing to it but there was a great bit in this in I think it was in the you know, in, in the second half, where the ball gets fizzed into Adams, he chests it, lays it back to Ward Prowse, and Ward Prowse immediately lays it off to the right hand side, I think, for, for Armstrong, which is when there's a cross for, for Ward Prowse, uh, for, for Walcott, which doesn't quite make it through. But Saints have just got this kind of, they're, they're so, we, we said this at the time, John, we were, we were what's happening, like, Ralph, they look better footballers. Yeah. I, he, he's up to the level of, so many players across this squad <clears throat> and you think you know, there's been a lot of players that have fallen by the wayside and, and Carl Anker used to talk about this in his um you know the couple of times he came onto the podcast and also in his um pieces he was always talking about Ralph was looking for players that are open-minded and I think we're starting now to see the fruits of Ralph's labors the Ralph what Ralph wants to do more than anything I think is impress a style upon the players and there's an interesting um, interview with Ralph, I think, where he's talking about Stuart Armstrong. And he said that basically they had quite a tough time at first because mm -hmm. Armstrong is in, he's, he's bright, he's opinionated, and he had a view on where his best position was. And Ralph had a different view. And he's had to really argue that one through with Stuart Armstrong and prove to him what he wants him to do and that he can be effective doing that. And, and this is the thing. I think like the Vestergaard that we saw at the weekend is, or on Friday was so much better than the vest guard that we've seen before. James Will Prowse has gone up. We've already talked you know, lots about how James Will Prowse has gone up a significant level. I think people who um, have been fans of other clubs where Danny Ings has played have said that you know he's always been great, but I wasn't aware that he was at that level. I'm sure Ralph has added something to that. Um, and there's just loads and loads of good build-up play in in the first half and uh, i think probably the next kind of big thing to talk about was was that walcott chance where i absolutely yeah. thought he'd scored again came from carl walker peters winning the ball back um this was a little bit more i thought sort of earlier saints where we'd kind of maybe hoof it up the field and then swarm the attackers i'm not saying it's all saints because we no longer do it but i think the kind of the vestigard sort of passing it through the middle and james will prowse and romeo being effective at making that transition from defense to attack i think was perhaps lacking from saints six months ago but this one was a bed and rack hoof up the up the pitch um you know carl walker peters winning the ball back really intelligent play from armstrong um amazing pass from Giuseppe. Do you remember this one, Tom? Where the yeah, ball fizzes this and he like back heels a through ball to back Walcott. Heels, back heel flick, which yeah. you know, he definitely meant as well. And um, which takes a load of players out of the game. I, yeah, I, I thought this was a goal. I have to say, I thought when when Theo stops, you know, and almost puts two defenders on last, thought he's going to call that in. Um, I think Theo thought, thought he'd scored as well, didn't he? Yeah. But again, you know, you mentioned him there. It's the first time I mentioned him. Carl Walker Peters. What a player. You know, like how have Saints 
you know, what what's going on with other teams' recruitment where you can buy an English 22 to 23 year old right back for 12 million pounds who has all this talent? And I, I looked at their, yeah, you know, the Athletic had a quite an interesting article, which was their top sort, of, you know, picks of the season, things they noticed this season. They asked four of their top reporters to pick their teams of the season. And Walker Peters is right back in both of them, in, mm. in two of the two of the four. Yeah, he looks phenomenal. Um, for, we we talk about this most weeks now, but my God, like what a footballer he looks like, and he looks like he's almost like completed the the jigsaw. Yeah, he's he's just fantastic. And what I think is kind of quite interesting about this Carl Walker Peters and Hoiberg deal is that, I mean, if you if you foray into the world of social media, all the Saints fans are absolutely di- delighted with Carl Walker-Peters, and we can't believe we've got Carl Walker-Peters in exchange for Hoiberg and some money. And all the Tottenham fans seem to be going like, oh, we can't, you know, we're so delighted with Hoiberg, we can't believe that we've got him for our kind of second choice uh, <laughs> right back. Third and, choice right back, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting though, isn't it? Because like both teams have come, and both players have come out of this transfer better than they better off than they were before. And, you know, I think Hoiberg has really added something that Tottenham needed. Yes. Um, after especially after Wanyama's kind of not not been involved, and um, yeah, Carl Walker Peters is just he's turning out to be one of our best pressers. Um, he's immensely skillful, and he seems so much more assured in a defensive right back position than Cedric ever ever did and and he offers more going forward he's got everything Tom what um this week whether you'd see uh Walker Peters get a call off I think England are probably quite well served him right back to Carl Walker and Kieran Trippier but yeah he can't be far off um he's you know I think obviously you've got Nils Lamptey who is also a very very good similar type of player but yeah he, he kind of, for, for Saints as well he's such a significant upgrade I think on what we had before, I think you're right. Cedric, you know, obviously won European Championships. He's obviously no mug, but I think he always divided opinion, Cedric. And I think, you know, part of that is because a lot of people just didn't really like him um, for whatever reason. Um, But Walker Peters is just, everyone loves him. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why Saints fans probably are very happy with this deal is not just Walker Peters. It's because Aurea Romeo has actually you know, been given license to be a footballer or, or has suddenly been given the confidence to be a footballer and to learn, you know, put those things you learn at La, Ma- at La Masia with Barcelona into play. And, you know, he's no longer this kind of clod hopper he gets booked every game. He's a kind of, he's an integral part of the system. I mean, he still gets booked every game, but yeah, he's not yeah. a clod hopper. You can't have everything, John. No, but... um. No, it's an interesting point about Romay. And I, I wonder if, you know, last season when he was put in, it was always kind of like, well, Hoiberg's done his bit. Um, now you need to go in and destroy and don't try and do anything funny because that's not what we need. We need you to kind of break up play. And he was always put in in those sorts of like, always put in those sorts of kind of situations where we needed to defend a, a lead. Um and now, with Hoiberg out the picture, he's been told, right, well, you need to be offering more. We've signed Diallo, or Diallo, who's yeah, going to be knocking on the door and, and we're going to want to bring him into the side. So he's got to up his game. He's got to offer a bit more than just being a destroyer. And he's doing it. He's, he's doing it brilliantly. Well, I think, you know, you have to think, I mean, would the Romeo of a season or two seasons ago have taken that shot against Newcastle? I don't think he probably would. And if he had done... Would he have hit it as well? Not in a million years. And I think so. There's something about. I mean, this, but this is all about. This is saying to it's confidence. Confidence, you, you know, courses through that team. And I think with the Premier League now, you know, once you get to your, you have, you'll always have players that are exceptional. You know, your Harry Kane's, your Raheem Sterling's, Aguero's, Van Dyke's. But to be honest, I think 90% of the players are probably broadly on a level. You know, and on, on a, and if they're having a good game, and if they feel confident, they can they can they can play better than the bloke in front of them, mm. even if that bloke in front of them is, you know, more high profile, more wages, more caps, more bigger transfer. You know, and and I I, I think that's the levels the Premier League is at now, and I think Romeo has just juiced it up a you know a percent or two, um, 
I mean, it's just, it's a shame the keeper got attached to that, isn't it? Because I mean, that would have been an. Ab- I think that would have gone. It might have even been one that would have got stuck in the stanchion. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he fizzed it, didn't he? Yeah. But again, it's a, it's a confidence. It's obviously he feels empowered to do that, John. Well, yeah. I mean, after he karate kicked the ball into the net um, <laughs> a few games ago, that you know, why not? And he's, I think he's had three shots now this season, and all three of them have been decent. One of them's ended up as a goal. So. What's going on, Tom? But this is the thing, isn't it? The the Newcastle game was all about Saints just dominating another, you know, a team that we have struggled against in the past. And with those injuries we have, you know, it was kind of all set up, wasn't it, for a kind of let's bring you back to earth. Yeah. And yeah. Carroll header in the seventy eighth minute moment. Oh yeah. But but it wasn't. It was, you know, like you say, that first goal was I mean, we even started talking about really the second half, but yeah. It was just super professional. No, I mean, other than that Romeo chance, I mean, we also had that that corner that Vestergaard um, headed back brilliantly for Bednarek, and it was headed off the line by Lascelles. Um, so there was that, you know, big chance. We then had the the kind of which I found quite strange this one, and and Armstrong perhaps wasn't having the most amazing game. He kind of almost had a bit of a Redmond game where he was involved quite a lot, but without much of a finishing touch and this was where we, it led to the Walcott penalty shout do you remember this it's a really quick kind of break yeah. and then a th- yeah through a turnover Armstrong's kind of like running towards goal and you I don't know I expect Armstrong to kind of have a shot here probably I mean it was, it was great Walcott uh, link up play between Walcott Adams then Armstrong having that 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 real chance to kind of run forward and then he played the through ball to Walcott instead he was joining the attack and um, I think Adam Blackmore described it as a hospital pass on yeah. on the radio and and the commentary on on Salent, which it it was because Lascelles probably nearly put Theo Walcott in hospital. It was a horrible tackle, wasn't it? I mean, I know he kind of grazed the ball before he got Walcott, but to me, Tommy looked totally out of control, and it was kind of wild looked, and dangerous. It looked. I mean, I'm very surprised with. The way that the rules are and the way referees are and the way VAR is right now, which seemingly any contact at all in the penalty area is a penalty. Uh, I'm very surprised that it wasn't given. I thought Theo's reaction at the end of the game was was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know we'll go on to talk interviews, which, by the way, was one of the most interesting interviews a footballer I've seen do in years. But, you know, I think I think the sales got it all. Um, not a huge amount. I think, it, but that kind of summed up Armstrong's night to that point, didn't it? Where Armstrong was getting in lots of interesting positions, but almost always waking or not quite getting it right when it came to the final final piece of the puzzle. Um, and it was a, you know, it was absolutely a hospital pass, and it almost put Theo in hospital. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, fairly shortly after that, well, I don't know how shortly after that was, but, but um, then Armstrong finally found the end product, didn't he, about five minutes from the end, mm. um, when Walcott kind of went on a bit of a marauding run and sort of ran out of options, didn't he, as he was getting closer to goal. The defence were closing in on him. Um, he didn't really have anyone to pass it to, and not a great sight at goal, so he loses the ball. And Longstaff... Um, kind of does what Almiron did in the first half, doesn't he? He, he just he stops and he thinks <laughs> for a second. In the worst position. Yeah, right in front of goal. Armstrong That's just. So weird. Yeah, and, and, and Armstrong just kind of says, "You know, thank you very much. I'll take that. Nice little bit of dribbling. Wrong foot's the goalie, and, and he and he makes it two now." I mean, I, I s- sort of felt a bit sorry for Steve B- Bruce because Steve Bruce gets a lot of grief online, as everyone does, I guess. And But also, at the same time, what can you do? You know, what do you do if two professional footballers dilly dally on the ball? What do you do if Sean Longstaff, who's meant to be like one of your trusted players, you know, your, your centre midfielders, you know, one of your leaders on the pitch, decides that with nine minutes to go and you being one nil down, that he's going to kind of try and do a drag back on them, you know, when he's being tackled by two players. I, I don't really know what he's meant to do here. And I think it's it just a very strange um, decision. But, you know, to be fair, it was the first time all night Armstrong had, um, had, had made the right decision and he absolutely nailed it. 
Yeah, I mean, he'd been involved in loads and loads. Of, I don't want to kind of downplay Armstrong's performance because I think he'd been in, involved in loads and loads of really good um, build-up play. But this was the point where he suddenly found the end product. And to be honest, when he fired off the shot, it didn't look like it was a particularly powerful shot, but I think he must have wrong-footed the keeper or given him the eyes or something because he managed to get it in the net. And there we go, Armstrong again. Yeah. And, and I yeah. think... And Darlow's no mug. No, so, very professional. Yeah, very professional job. And and then Alex McCarthy being the one player on the pitch who hasn't really been tested at any point at this point, gets his opportunity, doesn't he, by making a fantastic save from a Joel Linton um, header. Yeah, and I think that that as well tells us something, doesn't it, about Alex McCarthy and about how he's kind of come on this season. And yeah, he had a you know he had a nightmare against uh, you know for that first goal against Tottenham, but apart from that. You know, we, we've actually conceded quite a lot of goals this season, um, Saints, but we're scoring loads, so it seems to be OK. But, um, you know, Alex McCarthy, again, you know, he needed to step up there because knowing Saints, you know, if we had conceded that goal with Andy Carroll on the pitch, you know, you could have seen us coming away with a 2 or draw, but um, it was a brilliant save. Yeah, it really was. I mean, it looked spectacular as well. Um, you know, diving across goal, you know, training hand, tipping it over the bar, just, it looked fantastic, it was fantastic, and, you know, at the end of the game, we've won 2-0, that's three 2 nils in a row now, at St Mary's, three clean sheets in a row, I mean, that's unbelievable, isn't it, Tom? And then even more unbelievable, Saints finished that Friday night, top of the league, where we remained all the way through until Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Well, I mean, John, what were you last? I was probably, I think I was six when Saints last were top of the league. I was born in December 81. Yeah, I I think I was um, four years old. And I don't remember it, Tom. I've got to, <laughs> got to admit, I don't remember it at all. But it's funny because um, obviously Premier League, you know, football didn't exist before the Premier League. Um, but, you know, it was a beautiful time, but... Yeah, you know, John, I'm gonna I'll I'll lay a wager. I don't think that's gonna be the last time we're gonna be top of the Premier League this season. Do you think do you think we're gonna make our way back up there again, Tom? Yeah, I think we can Yeah. Why why not? I mean, genuinely, this is a crazy time in the world and the Premier League is crazy as well. And you know, you've got Aston Villa losing four three at home to Saints and then going away and beating Arsenal three 0 You've got Man United kind of all over the place. Man City yet to find their identity. Liverpool, to be fair, looking pretty amazing, but without Van Dijk, so they're kind of a bit weak. Yeah, I mean, they also managed to concede seven goals at Villa Park. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't think it will be, and I think the fixtures we've got coming up as well, which, you know, we might, we might talk to, um, you know, are difficult games, but they're not impossible games, and they're games Saints will fancy. Um, but if, but, you know, all, I mean, there was lots of talk, wasn't there? Like, you know, we're top of the league for the first time and, you know, people were, you know, doing bits on the radio about it and stuff. And I think but we deserve it. You know, like, they absolutely... The, the, what Ralph has done is is just phenomenal. And I think, um, you know, the, the challenge is going to be now is, is keeping expectations grounded. But I, he strikes me as the type of manager who will be able to do that. Yeah, I don't... I, th- I think it's kind of um, that we we talked about it, didn't we? After the Villa game, that if we'd gone on and just won that four nil, and they hadn't come back into it, there would have been a real temptation to sort of believe the hype and feel super confident, and maybe go into this game without concentrating. Thinking, oh, it's Newcastle. We're going to blow them away. We blew away Aston Villa, and we're just going to kind of go marching up up the league and. And we didn't. We, you know, we really, really concentrated and, and really focused on it. Um, and we've got that that win, which we thought was, yeah, you know, we've already talked about how, how good it was. And um, you know, now Tom, you're talking us up to potentially being table topping again at some point later on in the season. Um, I think we are now in the conversation for picking up, you know, potentially a top six position. I mean, I know there's a long, long way to get in the season, but we've started effectively enough. There's no reason why we shouldn't be thinking about it. Um, 
And I, I think kind of we've got to the point now where we've not had a few lucky games or mm. we've not hit just a, a really good patch of form. I think we are in good form. But this has been consistently happening now, probably since the start of the, the calendar year, I suppose. Or you know, certainly at least still the start of um, you know, the project restart. I mean, I've got a league table here, Tom, which is the annual Premier League table. So this is taking all the games of 2020. Um, Saints have won 14 games. Only Liverpool and Man City have won more than that. And um, so Liverpool, you know, no surprise, they're the best team in 2020. Um, they've 27 matches, won 19, drawn four and lost four. Man City won 16, drawn four and lost five. They only played a couple of fewer matches in Liverpool. Um then you've got Chelsea, Spurs and Southampton all on 46 points from 2020. And so that that's the sort of company we're keeping in terms of the way that we've played for the last 26 games. That's not that's not just good form, is it, Tom? You don't play well for 26 games. That is... That's two thirds of a season, John. Yeah. I mean, now we need to make it happen for the whole season. But that, that would have us fifth in goal difference, but it would be very much in the... Um, if we keep up that level of form, we're very much in for a shout of challenging that that top four. But also, John, I mean, if you look, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's a snazzy way of doing this, but if you look at sort of post the Leicester game, you know, which the, the game that we do not speak the name, but like, you know, our form since then has been pretty incredible. Um, so I, I would challenge, you know, we'd go back further, you can go back a year of football. And Saints have probably been top six team in that year. Um, and and you're right. I think the fascinating thing is that, of course, we have a you know a relatively small squad, um, and there will be challenges. But you know we've lost our top goal scorer and our top player, you know undoubtedly. But we've 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 shown that we can manage that. And the the funny thing is, is with the international break now, you've got two week international break, so. You know, what actually might happen is Danny Ings might only miss three games. Well, we've won one of those already. Um, you know, Wolves away, difficult, but they're having a bit of a strange start to the season. Man United at home, Saints will fancy that. So even if we're losing Danny Ings, is, 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 you know, they'll fancy that. And, and, and with, with Chad Adams, he obviously wants to step up. You know, he has very much, he's kind of the junior partner, isn't he, in that strike force. But he'll want to lay his claim as kind of alpha male so you know why can't they go on and do this i mean yeah there's some great teams in this league um um but but why why couldn't they well th i think this is the interesting thing tom because there are some great teams in this league but or are they i mean that's that that's that's the question i think i don't think any teams in the league this season are as good as the Liverpool and Man City of the last two, three seasons, the title winners of the last three seasons. I don't think Man City are at the level that they were the two seasons they won the title. I don't think Liverpool are quite at the level they were last season, although Diego Jota and Sadio Mane and mm -hmm. Salah are all looking really, really good. Um, I hate it when the top sides complain about f fatigue because they've got too many matches. Because they've hoovered up so many fantastic players from from across, but the, they're afraid of playing their second string. You know, despite the fact that their second string costs hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds, which means at some point those players should become more tired than the players of the clubs. You know, like Southampton, like Wolves, like Everton, like Aston Villa, who are currently. In and around that area. And and I think this season's got a bit of that 15-16 whiff about it. Do you know what I mean? The, the season where Leicester won the league and Saints finished sixth. I think Man United are definitely getting through a, a funny time. Chelsea have done really well in terms of their recruitment. I think they've got some really good players, but I think they're also there for the taking. Liverpool aren't quite as good as they were last season. Man City definitely aren't as good as they've been recently. Arsenal look hopeless. So... Spurs look very good. Spurs look very good, actually. But then they're still Spurs. So th there is an opportunity there, isn't there? I mean, if you're going to break 
the monop- uh, I don't think the monopoly of the big six will be maintained this year. I'd hope not, because I, th- I think football needs a change. And I, I think one of the fascinating things about the sort of project big picture thing um, was is the kind of, someone points out with Man United that, you know, this sort of belief that Man United actually deserve to be in that sort of group, which of course they do by the size of their brand and the size of their club. But there's no guarantee of any club, you know, remaining amongst the best clubs. No, well, I think that's why they want to do it, isn't it? Because yeah. that way they can hoard all the money and the resources and make sure that those end up staying in the big, six biggest clubs in the country, don't they? And I think yeah. they must be looking at the likes of Wolves, Leicester, Southampton, Everton, Villa and thinking, oh, cry. But also, you actually, you read those names, like Leicester, Wolves, Villa, Everton, like they're all clubs with a lot of history. They all go yeah. back over a hundred years. They've all had some success over the the course of history, haven't they? Yeah, and they all have a model. Mm. Yeah, and this is the difference now, isn't it? Is is clubs have a kind of blueprint? And to that point about Saints, Saints aren't going to be scared of playing anyone this season. You know, like if you look at like Ward Prowse, and uh, you know we we talk about him a lot, and I was a critic of him, and I was, you know, I I was. I was. I feel like I'm, I'm still comfortable. So I was right at the time, but in the long term, I'm definitely wrong. Um, second in Premier League goals since Kevin De Bruyne to Kevin De Bruyne. Um, in terms of like, midfielders. Just, yeah, since terms of midfielders. What is he like? Fourth in tackles, seventh in interceptions. You know, he dominates games. He absolutely dominates games and. There's going to be no one that James Ward Prowse and Romeo are going to be worried about playing against because of the system. Yeah, and I think this is the difference now. Like Saints believe they have a system, which they believe they yeah, which if they utilise, and they they do it effectively, and they do exactly what Ralph tells them to, which is one of the fascinating things about having no crowds, is you can hear Ralph telling the players basically exactly what to do. Um, they'll believe they can get points off anyone. Yeah. I've, I, I, Tom, I want to bring you up on one of those points there because that Ralph being able to communicate with the team constantly is one of the things that I picked up as potentially one of the reasons why we're doing so well now. Um, He has, you know, I I don't know if everyone else got the same sort of channel as me, but I managed to pick the channel without the crowd noise um, on Friday instead of getting the one which has this sort of piped in crowd noise and it was fascinating like ev- like ralph talked well he didn't talk he shouted for the entire 90 minutes of the match every time a saints player was on the ball even when saints didn't have the ball he was directing the players and telling them exactly what to do um my worry is is that when fans come back are, are the players still going to know what to do tom i mean maybe not to the same sort of extent that they do right now but perhaps they'll be so well drilled by the point that fans are allowed back in stadiums that and you know i'm into i absolutely want to go back to st mary's and go and watch saints because this team is brilliant and i want to be there to to cheer them as they're doing their brilliant things but how how do we ensure that ralph is still able to communicate with his players in that situation because it looks like it's working well i I guess this all comes down to yeah, uh, one of the great things about Ralph, and I, we do sound like fanboys when we say Ralph, but I think one of the great things, if you compare him to like Hughes or Pellegrino, um, one of the great things about Ralph is that he clearly has a philosophy. You know, and, and one of the, the things, and also, isn't it great that the number of things we've we've learned about football since this guy was in charge of our football club in terms we use, like like the red zone and turnovers, also like automatisms yeah you know who of any of us uh, had heard of in football automatisms well, tom let's let's do a bit of football vocabulary here just in case any of our listeners haven't caught up so what's ralph's red zone so ralph's red zone is the area between the midfield and the attack and essentially ralph's philosophy one of ralph's beliefs i believe and if, if i'm wrong he's welcome to come on the podcast and correct us is essentially you flood and you press the red zone to force your opposition players to make mistakes and to to lose the ball in the area that's most damaging because in Ralph's world, um, 
you are better off, I think, like winning the ball high up the pitch and shooting than you are um, doing anything else. That's much more likely to lead to a goal, I think, is what the red zone is. Yeah, and uh, I think another part of his philosophy about getting in the red zone is that um, if you can get a shot away within, I think, 10 seconds of winning the yes. ball back, then you have a higher chance of scoring or, or something. I think there's some statistical base for it but that's that's the way Ralph plays isn't he attack press that red zone blood the red zone and then this is also that other word that you used in the vocabulary before the turnover the turnover is when Saints when Carl Walker Peters, Peters robs the ball off Almiron and then Walcott picks up that's a turnover of possession isn't it yeah and if you look at what Saints players are tasked to doing Danny Ings leads you know that Shea Adams very aggressive in doing that and essentially Saints is Saints game is virtually not all about, but seemingly all about winning the ball off someone high up the pitch and giving that ball immediately to someone else. And then the third word you said there, Tom, was the automatisms. Yes. And that is, is that that's the automatic reaction so that as soon as Danny Ings presses in the red zone, there's an automatic reaction from the rest of the players. Is that right? Yeah, I believe it's the idea, and I think you see this with Saints now, and I think you particularly see this with the Ward Prowse and a Romeo in the midfield, is um, we we know as soon as we win the ball in any part of the pitch, we seem to know what we're going to do with it. And I, I think that's the difference is now, is that Saints don't even really know what they're doing. Of course they do, but they're, they are so well drilled and so well practiced and so into this system that they believe works for them that they don't really think about it it's it's you know it's done automatically and um i think the the walker peters tackle on almiron is a great example of both of those things of well all three isn't it coming together it's flooding the red zone it's um it's you know turning the ball over to an attack-minded, uh, to, to a player who can do more damage than you in that moment, and then it's the or you know it's the automatism of getting that ball, you know, no, of, of of winning it in the first place. So it all kind of comes together and becomes kind of heavy metal football. Yeah, uh, heavy metal football. Or did he pick up this one, Tom? Like pirates instead of the navy, yeah. swashbuckling football. I think we might have to call ourselves now. I like it. Yeah. But it, you know, but isn't it great that we've got a manager that we feel that he's bringing this to our club at every level of our club? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it, it's really great to see it. And it's really great to understand what the players are trying to do. See it. Opposition managers understanding what Saints are trying to do, seeing it and still not being able to do anything about it. And and you could see um Steve Bruce was exasperated in his post-match interview. He, he, he explained that he knew what Saints were going to do and he said that Saints were too good at doing it, that his team couldn't stop them. And that is, the, I mean, I know people will talk about kind of the praise that you get from the like of Guardiola or um, Klopp more than you do from Steve Bruce, but ultimately those games are really important to win. Um, and if we can overwhelm Newcastle, who know exactly what our game plan is going to be, set up to try and stop it and do something and then they're just totally hopeless and, and can't do anything about it then you know all power to um ralph's elbow really yeah also you have to think i mean there's there's 20 teams in the premier league one of them is saints that means saints are going to play 19 other teams of those 19 teams four are managed by managers like a guardiola or a clock that leaves 14 teams that you can you can do that to yeah um and then say so the the other thing when and i think we need to we're talking about post-match interviews we're talking about automatisms fitting to ralph's plan Theo walcott has managed to kind of slot into ralph's game plan and he's playing with an energy and enthusiasm that i'm adoring watching i just i love him already tom i i think he's he's doing really great but how did he just fits in this team doesn't he, he he seems to understand exactly what Ralph's doing. And you can see um, when he's on the pitch, he's looking around. He's looking for those signals, I think, from the other players. But he's also looking to start some of those automatisms as well, start the presses. He's running around. He's got so much energy. I think perhaps he's maybe 
pressing more than some of the other players just because he doesn't 100% know when to do it. But it doesn't <laughs> seem to be stopping him from being able to play the entire match and still look energetic towards the end. So what, what have you made of Theo Walcott's return? I thought it, I thought it was really interesting when he joined because Saints, Ralph isn't really, um, you don't strike, he doesn't strike, he was a particularly sentimental man. Um, yeah, he's a winner. Winners aren't generally sentimental, I think. But one of the things when 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 Walcott joined, you heard a lot about, well, you know, what you know when he when the deal became available, Ralph's question was, yeah, does he work hard? Can he learn? Is he going to be a good example to the other players? And clearly he is. But more more so, it, you know, we spoke only about his intelligence and how good his close control is. He, I think he's a he's a level above probably most other Saints players in terms, particularly our wing players in terms of. Yeah, and when I say that, I mean like Redmond and Gineppo in terms of close control and decision making. Um, you know, he he doesn't try and do more things than are necessary to hurt the opposition. Um, but also, you know, more than that, John is is you know footballers nowadays, rightly or wrongly, um, mostly because of people like me and my job are anodyne, boring. Um, they they talk in. Um, you know, they're talking kind of cliches and, you know, we go again and, you know, disappointing result. The lads are really gutted. Um, you know, they're kind of boring, aren't they, footballers now? There's, there's not really many characters. Um, and that's because they're, they're trained to kind of not show you what they're really thinking. Um, Theo Walker, I thought, after the Newcastle game was a breath of fresh air because he looked like some, you know, he didn't care, did he, what, what people thought about what he was saying. No, and and he brought up two names, which um, oh, yeah. <laughs> not not many people who are watching on Sky oh, Sports would, would necessarily recognise. But Kenwin Jones and Ricardo Fuller, he said, were playing up front the last time we played at St Mary's, which real blast from. I tell you what, actually, Kenwin Jones would be a good shout for that sort of um, cult hero. Cult hero. Well, he'll never get cult hero with because the way the manner in which he left Saints, but he w- he was he, a great he striker. Sunderland? He went to Sunderland, but he went on strike, didn't he? Did he? He, did he, he wasn't he, it like some sort of like a, like athletics player that decided to start playing football when he was actually really good at yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, he's Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, and really big guy, really muscular, um, in, yeah, incredible athlete, and he was a bit he was a bit rubbish for a while. And then suddenly started like banging them in and looked like, you know, a wonderful striker. But he, he kind of, he did the Van Dyke before Van Dyke did it, didn't he? He kind of started sulking, went on strike, refused to play and then got his transfer to Sunderland. I think we were in the championship at the time. Um, but yeah, he was great for a bit. But Theo Walcott bringing up Kenwin Jones and Ricardo Fuller was, you know, while Saints are top of the league, you know, it was one of those games where you sit and you watch all the post-match interviews because you're just reveling in the moment and you want to see the league table appear on the Sky Sports screen and everything and it was just fantastic and I think Theo Walcott has been looking forward to having that opportunity to play back at St Mary's again gutted that we're not there to to support him and and Mm -hmm. show him the love but um, it was emotional for him he clearly is emotional but he's not He's not emotional in a way that's sort of out of control. He's he's dedicated to the team and he's doing really well. Yeah, and he's obviously um, he's obviously quite a rational person as well. He's trying to he actually strikes he strikes as highly intelligent, highly erudite, um, but passionate. And I think he, you know, what a great example we've got. You know, for our squad depth which is, uh, let's best place to say, is, is probably not the best. Um, we've got a lot of players like Dan Alunderloo, Nathan Teller, Michael Obafemi, who will benefit, hopefully, you know, Jan Valerie, hopefully benefit hugely from having someone like Walcott around. Mm. Um, he's 31. He looks fit as a butcher's dog. Really positive attitude. And he's, he's playing through the centre and he's absolutely loving it. Yeah, I mean... Also, I'd, I'd kind of try and add to our younger listeners, Tom, that 31 is not dead. No. You know, I, I'd love to be 31, Tom. I'd say, <laughs> as I'm listening to, uh, to another footballing podcast, and they're talking about Thiago Silva. He's 36 years old and playing in the Premier League. And, you know, outfield player, 36, playing in the Premier League. To my mind, 
I'm I'm I like that. I'm also 36 years old, Tom. So, you know, I'm glad that my my pre- my potential Premier League career isn't quite over yet. Someone's still doing it outfield out there. You can still make it, John. <laughs> probably not in Ralph Saint side though. I don't know if I'm probably not open minded enough. Um. So I mean, the, 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 these were my talking points, Tom. You know, being top of the league, Theo Walcott just fitting the team. The Vestigar's ability to pass between the lines and bring the midfield into play, which I think we talked about earlier. Um, Ralph being able to communicate with the team constantly, and and our twenty twenty form, or just you know whether we're not in form, whether we're just now a, a really good side. W- were there any other kind of like of those big macro topics that you wanted to to speak about? I, th- I think a lot of credit um, has to go to Shay Adams as well. Yeah, he kind of he's leading that line. I think he's he's absolutely vital to the Saints. And and I thought it was interesting how um, you know how he took that goal on on Friday because yeah he does have a tendency to to lash it often with a you know with his laces, but this time he kind of just side footed it, and and maybe that sort of signifies a a cooler, more considered Shea Adams. Um, but I just think they're they're an amazing group of athletes. I, I just you know I can't remember John the last time I was so excited to watch them play again. Yeah, I I can't wait for the Wolves game. We I mean, can get we can you know we can get we can get points out of that. Yeah. Um. So listeners, we're, we're up next. We've got Wolves, and that's in oh, eleven days time. Saturday the the twenty first November. Then we've got Man United the weekend after that. Brighton, Sheffield United, Arsenal, Man City, Fulham, West Ham, Liverpool. That's our run run into the new year. And um, I don't know, I'm feeling confident, Tom. I, I kind of almost wish that we had Liverpool almost right now whilst they're playing all these Champions mm-hmm. League games. And, and the same with Man City. I quite fancy us taking on these teams whilst they're like busy feeling sorry for themselves for having European football. Um, but I'm confident, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We've got the international break. That's more time for Danny Ings to recover. It's more time for James Will Prowse to recover. It's more time for Ryan Bertrand to recover. Um, and I, you know, I think we're playing with a with a proper pirate swashbuckling swagger at the moment. You're absolutely right. And I think you know, to your point earlier, John, about this league feels weird. This season feels weird. The other thing you you just mentioned is absolutely in our favour is. Saints are going to be coming when we come up against the top teams, the teams that are genuinely better than Saints. Those players will have played on Wednesday or Thursday, so Saints have an advantage there straight away. Um, and you know, I thought it was interesting, you know, Klopp and Guardiola and everyone, you know, moaning about you know that they're these 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 incredibly expensive squads of players that they don't play anyway. Um, but then they're not able to put on the bench. Um, you know, well, that's that's how it is. You know, that's that's the game. And, you know, I love the way that now now the season is starting to not maybe look how everyone, how they want it to look. They're like, well, you know, we need to kind of change the rules now <laughs> halfway through the season. And it's like, okay, well, you know, if you want to have five subs, three of those, you know, two of those players, someone put on Twitter, which is a really good idea, should be under 21 products of your team. So you can bring on three players that are not, but then if you want to bring on another two subs, those two have to be under 21 players produced by your team. And I think, because ultimately all this does otherwise is just garnish the big teams. Mm. Which means another superstar can come on to rescue a point or rescue three points. Um, You know, the league is, you know, and football is, is bent enough towards the big clubs. We don't need more, you know, we don't need this, you know, artificial substitutions just to give them another leg up. No, and uh, this is the interesting thing. I think if you go back to when the Premier League started back in 1992, the big sides didn't win anywhere near as many games as they do now to win the title. The idea that a club would get 100 points was just ludicrous back then. They'd have to be, they'd be seen as some sort of incredible beast. And that is because there's been a widening of the gap, I suppose, of the Liverpools and Man Cities from the rest of the, the Premier League that don't have the sort of resources that, that the big six team team do. So um, I like it. I, I like the mix-up. I like the fact that, you know, 
we're looking at the table and people are talking about, can Leicester do it again? Are Tottenham going to win the league? Are Everton going to mount a serious challenge? Are Aston Villa going to still be up there? Can Saints top the table again? This It's just so much more compelling, I think, as a football fan than, oh, a Liverpool going to win the next game? Well, of course they are because they've got the best squad and they're playing against a squad which are hopeless. Oh, and if it's all going wrong after 60 minutes, don't worry, we can bring on five more superstars and change it. Yeah, completely. And also, look, if the big teams are stupid enough, like like Chelsea, I mean, like we, yeah, we drew three all there, but like, if Chelsea want to spend £200 million on forwards and not buy a single defender apart from a 36-yard, admittedly very good 36-yard on a free transfer, then more for them. Mm. Yeah, they have their chances to make their first 11 so much better than anyone else. I mean, I, I've got to admit, Tom, I think that's probably what I would do if I was an oligarch as well. Just spend £200 million on snazzy... Snazzy forwards, yeah. Really good Sophia and Bufals. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but th- this is the choice they make. I mean, like, you know, if you, if you look at it, they all have choices about where they want to spend their money and they want to spend their money on either loads of money on terrible defenders like Harry Maguire or loads of money on very, very good attackers. Um, you know, Saints are doing something different. They're building something. You know, they're making players better. Um, and you wonder, don't you? Like, I mean, you don't want to see Ralph leave. There's lots of talk about him going to Man United, but would he even get that job? Because... Isn't the whole point of jobs like that is they don't give you the time to make players better. They just want you to go and buy loads of players um, and make it work immediately, which is why the weird sort of anachronism about Ralph, you know, not being someone who's, whose first reaction is to go to the checkbook. And instead, it's his reaction to look at the squad, look at the players he's got, look at the reserves and the youth players and look and see what he can build. And in many ways, like his main strength is what might put off one of the big teams from taking him because they might think, well, yeah, we can't give this guy three years. Yeah. I mean, Ralph signed a four-year contract. I know in the world of football that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I'm hoping that he is now excited by what's going on at Saints. And his post-match interview after Newcastle was quite interesting as well because he said it was scary. He knew that Saints were top and he said it was scary what was happening at Saints. And I, I, I think I know what he means. He means it's scary because... He's he's realizing that Saints are doing something that is out of the ordinary. And it's scary because he sort of believes in them and he thinks that they can do it. And um, you know, while well, you know, he's probably also scary that if they don't do it, then then what's gonna happen? it's the adrenaline rush, isn't it? I think he's got it at Saints. I think he's looking at it and thinking, bloody hell, this is working. And there was a great bit at the end of the Newcastle game where uh, he, he, apparently this was Henry Winter, said that he heard Ralph say, keep it there, let them run, to Jan Bednarek, you know, rather than give the opposition the ball, like, tie them, like, let them, you know, let them work for it. And I think the thing is with Saints, what Saints have got, which is something I don't think we even had on the Koeman, is we're cruel. You know, we are, we're nasty now, not just in the way that we play with, you know, Ward Prowse and the gamesmanship and the tactical fouls and spreading the fouls out around the team, but we're kind of ruthless with it. And I think Ralph's instilled like a a cruelty to Saints and, you know, good teams are cruel teams. And I, I, you know, again, it's really exciting. I love the man. He's great. (laughs) Well, I think listeners on on that note, I mean, we've given you a bonus 10 minutes, I think, which is what you're getting for a a table topping weekend (laughs) at Saints. Um, We're feeling really, really optimistic about whatever, everything that's going on at the moment. Um, You know, we've got an international break now. We can't wait for the game against Wolves. We'll see you in, you know, a couple of weeks time for, for another episode of the Saints FC podcast. And let's hope that we are just as enthusiastic and, and, and excited by what by what's going on then. Um, <clears throat> remember, if you want to make use of that 20% off and free postage, it's manscaped.com and then the offer code Saints, all in block capitals. If you want to complain about me choosing Fabrice Fernandez as my sort of um, 
wild card player for for the the ultimate saints 11 then uh, you can email saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com and do let us know what you thought thought of that ultimate 11 episode and do have a listen to it if you can um tom lovely to see your face again and uh, i look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks time and you johnny take care yeah cheerio everyone